r slash credit. What sounds like fiction, but is actually a real historical event? The marathon at the 1904 Olympics in Street. Louis. The first place finisher did most of the race in a car. He had intended to drop out and got a car back to the stadium to get his change of clothes and just kind of started jogging when he heard the fanfare. The second place finisher was carried across the finish line, legs technically twitching, by his trainers. They had been refusing him water and giving him a mixture of brandy and rat poison for the entire race. Doping wasn't illegal yet and this was a terrible attempt at it, so he got the gold when the first guy was revealed. Third finisher was unremarkable, somehow. Fourth finisher was a Cuban mailman who had raised the funds to attend the Olympics by running non-stop around his entire country. He landed in New Orleans and promptly lost all of the traveling money on a riverboat casino. He ran the race in dress shoes and long trousers, cut off at the knee by a fellow competitor with a knife. He probably would have come in first, well, second, behind the car, had it not been for the hour nap he took on the side of the track. After eating rotten apples he found on the side of the race. Ninth and twelfth finishers were from South Africa and ran barefoot. South Africa didn't actually send a delegation. These were students who just happened to be in town and thought it sounded fun. Ninth was chased a mile off course by angry dogs. Note, these are the first Africans to compete in any modern Olympic event. Half the participants had never raced competitively before. Some died. Street. Louis only had one water stop on the entire run. This, coupled with the dusty road, and exacerbated by the cars kicking up dust, lead to the above fatalities. And yet, somehow, rat poison guy survived to get the gold. The Russian delegation arrived a week late because they were still using the Julian calendar. In 1904. Seriously. This needs to be a movie. This sounds like some Monty Python shit. You forgot the worst bit, that they only had one water stop on purpose, because the official running things wanted to study dehydration. Return of Napoleon. An army was sent to intercept him, and they ended up fighting for him. If it was shown in a movie most people would have considered it cheesy and unrealistic. I think a great part is that you can trace his 100 days by newspaper editorials. As he got closer writers went from making fun of him, or criticizing him to praising him and welcoming his return. The French military loved Napoleon, did not love the crown they were forced to serve when Napoleon was first defeated. It was depicted in a film, Waterloo, notable for using massive numbers of Soviet troops to depict thousands of British and French soldiers in period uniform. Well worth a watch. The Great Stink of London in 1858. One summer the heat dried up the River Thames, where all the human waste went, and an unbearable smell pervaded throughout the entire city. All Parliament representatives were eventually coerced out of their homes outside of London to convene and solve the issue. Much to the citizens' glee, Parliament was held in their building on the bank of the River Thames resulting in one of the fastest parliament decisions ever made to reform the London sewer system. And the guy they had designed the system did it so well, the bulk of his planning is still in place today, with modern improvements. Stuff you should know did a great podcast on this a few weeks ago. I'm so glad I'm not the only one. Fascinating episode, I couldn't believe, the Tideway project was the first major upgrade to London sewer systems since Sir Joseph Basil Jett's designs of 150 years ago. Fully recommend everyone, Londoners especially, listen to that Sisk episode above. Vesna Vulavi fell from a height of 10,160 meters and lived. She holds the world record for surviving the highest fall without a parachute. Anything more than 450 meters and you might as well go for the record. There are also, if I recall correctly, only 7 known people to have survived with no shoot over 5000 meters. Yeah, once you hit about 120 miles per hour falling you don't go any faster. 
Once you're falling you can adjust the angle of your fall, landing up to 2 third s the height you fell from in any direction. Assuming you're falling from a great height like a plane, and not a building, as well as adjusting the angle you'll hit the ground. You land in a tree or really thick greenery, that's great and can save you. No trees or greenery? Land at an angle, and do the 5 points of impact to break the fall. Pretty sure landing in water is just a no-go all around though, and the survival rate is significantly lower. When King Edward I was young, before he was king, he was a prisoner of Simon de Montfort during a civil war. During his captivity he asked to ride the horses at the castle, where he was being held. He proceeded to ride them one by one, tiring them all out. When it came to the last horse he mounted, bade his captors farewell and rode away. All of the other horses were too tired to give effective chase. Wow, that reads right out of a novel, written to teach young readers about cleverness or something. Took me a while to find what he said when he fled. He allegedly said, Lordings, I bid you good day. Greet my father well, and tell him I hope to see him soon, to release him from custody. His father, Henry III, was also a prisoner. The town of Rothenburg ob der Tauber in Germany, one of the country's oldest and most preserved cities. Essentially during the Thirty Years' War, the Catholic army wanted to destroy the town because they resisted the church. Count Von Tilly, sounds like a Monty Python name, was going to destroy the town, but as a gesture of peace the town offered him a mass, 3.25 L, of local wine. He declared that, if anyone in the town, could drink the mass of wine in one go, he would spare the town and move on. Then someone just walked up and did it. So the army left. Much much later during World War II, when the US was performing air raids, someone in the White House knew of this town and pleaded that we do not destroy it. So it has been saved from two wars all because one guy chugged a bunch of wine. Edit. Apparently there was some damage done in WWII, but I don't know if it was bombed. It's also not one of the oldest cities, but one of the most preserved. I just posted from memory from my German culture and history class in college. Thanks for the feedback. That's a solid excuse for alcoholism. Hans, don't you think you've had enough? We would all be dead with that attitude, Ingrid. Part of the city wall was destroyed in WWII. I was there in 1997 and the town was still selling donation bricks to repair it. Sky Pirates. During World War I German Zeppelins would board and search foreign ships, and the boarding party of the L-23 once captured the Norwegian three-masted cargo schooner Royal by bluffing the crew with a flare gun after they accidentally dropped their machine gun into the sea while lowering from their airship. So you're saying the world had airship pirates then? Damn missed my life's work by 100 years or so. No kidding. Damn. I would have been good at that one. This reads like the subplot of an unmade Wes Anderson movie. That is frightfully appropriate. The London Beer Flood of 1814. When one vat of beer at Mukes and Co. Brewery exploded, it proceeded to cause a domino effect of other vats to also burst, causing a tidal wave. That flooded a neighborhood, leaving crumbled homes in its path as well as 8 people dead and dozens injured. Boston had the molasses flood. I've added drowning in food to my preferred list of ways to not die. Yes, even beer. In 1875 a fire on Chamber Street in Dublin caused whiskey to flood the streets 13 people died, none from burning, smoke inhalation or injuries caused by flooding. All 13 died of alcohol poisoning from drinking the street whiskey and many more were admitted to hospital but survived. Imagine the citizens helping with the cleanup effort. By chugging street booze. Paddy Roy Bates, the founding king of Sealand, had his country, a small naval platform, invaded and his son Michael taken hostage by Dutch and German mercenaries. They came in riding jet skis, speedboats, and helicopters while he was in England buying groceries. He hired a helicopter came down a rope with a shotgun, reconquered Sealand and took the mercenaries hostage. 
An official German diplomat was sent to negotiate the release of the Ringleader. This sounds like a fun Steven Seagal movie. This isn't the full story. The guy had a boat he used as a radio station, which then became illegal. I believe it was something along the lines of it being considered a pirate radio station. The guy then made his own country, Sealand, complete with everything needed to make an official country. This meant stamps, currency, and a flag. Also he could have his radio station. Don't forget that the guy who hired the mercenaries then set up a government in exile for Sealand and issued fake passports, fake diplomatic plates and immunity, in addition to Russia and Iraq using his seal and rebel government to launder money. In 496 BC the army of King Gaugian of Yu put three ranks of criminals in the front of their battle formation. Their task was to impress the enemy with their ferocity and commitment by chopping off their own heads as soon as battle was joined. The tactic was a success, while their opponents from the state of Wu were recovering from their astonishment they were overrun by the rest of the Yu army. The convicts, who were condemned men anyway, had been coerced by the threat that, if they didn't comply with this plan their families would be executed also. Stephen Fryonke. I think cutting off one's own head is pretty unlikely, but they might have slit their own throats. True. But whatever method the convicts were forced to use, and considering that the opponents likely had no idea that they were condemned criminals, that's got to be one of the most effective direct acts of psychological warfare of all time. Note, by direct I mean one that's targeted at a specific local audience with immediate effects, as opposed to psychological warfare tactics that operate with a wider range and time frame. Like lowering the morale of a whole city or country as word of the event spreads, or confusing slash misdirecting a whole military force. The Japanese Kamikaze Divine Wind, that saved the country from an amphibious invasion by the Mongolian hordes. The Mongols captured a foothold on some outlying Japanese islands, and started to attack the mainland. The Japanese army pushed them back, and they had to retreat to China. When they did, a typhoon ravaged their navy and sank their ships. The Mongolians, probably reasonably, seeing this as a fluke, decided to rebuild and attack again. Seven years later, unfortunately for them, the Japanese fortified their coastline. After basically months of sailing around seeking a place to land, another typhoon struck their fleet and destroyed them. There would be no third invasion. Then they had some fun fighting for a bit, before they died in a tornado. Bill Wirtz. The Americans had invasion plans set up for, if the Nooks didn't bring surrender. They went unused. However, on the planned date of the invasion a massive typhoon hit the location it was intended to be. Some guy in Australia, decided he wanted to hunt rabbits, but rabbits don't live in Australia. So then he released like 12 in his backyard and now there's a duck ton of rabbits in Australia. Similar thing happened with goats. TL, the R3 goats turned into 250,000 on an island, so they went in and killed them all. It's crazy, but this video by Real Life Law talks about it. Edit, to clear things up the island, had a lot of animals not found anywhere else that were starving due to the goats eating all their food. Edit 2, so turns out it was actually 250,000 goats, not 500,000. Edit 3, this wasn't Australia. Germany has the same problem for the same reason, except with raccoons. Jacob Baboon who was employed to change rail signals. After initial skepticism, the railway decided to officially employ Jack once his job competency was verified. The baboon was paid 20 cents a day and a half bottle of beer each week. It is widely reported that in his 9 years of employment with the railroad, Jack never made a mistake. I wonder what that salary negotiation was like. Somebody send this to Carol Pilkington. What does a baboon spend 20 cents a day on? You'd be surprised about the organizational skills of baboons, but did you know a group of them is called a congress? 
the owner and bartender of a bar once tried to take out an insurance policy on one of their alcoholic customers with one of their friends in an attempt to make some fast cash. They immediately opened his tab up, hoping he would drink himself to death. That didn't work, so they began spiking his unlimited drinks with antifreeze. That didn't work, so they decided to pump carbon monoxide into his apartment one night. He still wouldn't die. They then beat him savagely and put him in the back of their car to bury him in a rural area. Halfway out there, they heard noises coming from the trunk of the car. He still hadn't died, and when they stopped and got him out, he began walking away under his own power. It took three times being hit with a car to finally kill him. That man may be the closest thing we've ever had to a superhero. Edit. Since posting I've been made aware that his name was Michael Marloy. If anyone wants to read further about his story. Modern Rasputin. The entire taping rebellion. A war started by a Chinese peasant who dreamed and believed he was Jesus' younger brother. Although poor, the first thing he did was have a giant demon slaying sword forged. Took over a city. Asked the British why they wouldn't pay him tribute as the new head of their faith. Engaged in total war with the king. Applied said of communist policies like abolishing private property. Separated women and men from ever interacting and sent the women to the front lines. Over 20 million people died, with some estimates as high as 40 million. It was the fourth deadliest conflict in human history. It killed more people than WWI. Only WWII, transition of the Ming, and Qing conquest of the Ming were deadlier. China is in another league when it comes to wholesale slaughter. You've reached the end? You're a star. Destroy the subscribe button for more like that.